welcome to the Shroud of Turin presentation for tonight. This is one of my most favorite subjects to talk about because it's not often that you see something in the world that seems to so positively affirm everything you believe. But as Christians, I think that there's a lot of reassurances that the Shroud of Turin is the true burial cloth of Christ. So I'm hoping to persuade you of that tonight. Now, in the past, I have tried to cover all the information about the Shroud of Turin all at once by going over the history and the science all at the same time in one presentation. However, as the years have gone by, all of that information has grown so much that I can no longer do it in one sitting. So this is the first time that I have divided the entire talk into two parts. So now it's two talks, two presentations, and this first part is going to be about the science behind the Shroud of Turin. Now the science is probably the most fascinating part of the Shroud because you know there are a lot of scientific mysteries about the Shroud. And since the Shroud is potentially a miracle that we can hold in our hands, if you have access to it, of course, <laughs> you know, the fact that we may be able to scientifically prove that it's a miracle is all the more astounding. So that's why I want to start with the science instead of the history, because the history is only really interesting if the science has already sort of compelled you to wonder where this thing came from. So I will go over a little bit of history tonight, but it won't be the full history of the Shroud. That will be for part two, which will be in two weeks. So to begin with, I want to give credit to all of these people for doing all of this research themselves. <laughs> Because the truth is, is that I'm just a consumer of their research, and I like to put it into my own presentation to try to persuade people myself. But the truth is, is there are lots and lots of people who have done really incredible research on the Shroud, uh, people who were part of the original 1978 investigation, which we will talk about tonight. So there are a lot of really great resources out there that you can go to. John Jackson was the leader of the Sturt Project in 1978. His website is shroudofturin.com. He has a book called A Critical Summary that was published in 2017, but you can actually download it for free, the PDF, at this link right here. And that is where the bulk of my information tonight is coming from. So I've built on top of a lot of that since there have been updates since 2017. But I built on top of that using research that has come in over the last few years. Then, of course, there's Barry Schwartz. He was the official photographer for STIRP in 1978, and he has his own website called shroud.com. And then, technically, the official website for the Turin Cathedral is sindone.org. That's the website for the Archdiocese of Turin, Italy. And then there is Vern Miller's website, shroudphotos.com that's a really extraordinary place to get good high resolution photographs of the shroud and he also was on the stirp team in 1978. For the historical portion that you're not going to hear as much of tonight there's Jack Markward who's done a lot of really terrific research and then there's Joe Marino who has done a lot of historical and scientific research as well so I'm very thankful to those guys. And I'm also extremely thankful for all of the hardworking translators of ancient manuscripts from all over the world because that's a tough job to have. We really take their work for granted. You know, the fact that, for example, we can Google, we can Google the Epic of Gilgamesh and read the Epic of Gilgamesh in English because these people have spent decades of their lives trying to decipher if these words really mean what we think they mean. So people have done a lot of hard work in that regard and that has helped us a lot in our search for the truth behind the Shroud of Turin. And then lastly, of course, I want to thank my dad, Ben Smith. He is the one who compiled the first version of this presentation. He had a two-page summary of the Shroud that he compiled after he read a couple of books about it. He showed it to me. He created sort of a rudimentary presentation with it, and then I just built on it from there. 
And eventually he just gave it to me and he let me present on it myself. And that presentation where I first presented on it by myself is the video on my YouTube channel currently called Shroud of Turin Photograph of the Resurrection that now has about 130,000 views. <laughs> so I really owe that to my dad. But my dad passed away in 2020 and um, he is truly looking Christ in the face now. And um, I really think that the shroud is uh, one of the closest things we have now to, to looking Christ in the face visually anyway. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> And there are other resources throughout the presentation as well. But yeah, I mean, there are tons of good resources online that you can look at for the Shroud of Turin. Just know that if you just Google stuff about the Shroud of Turin, you're going to get a lot of second, third-hand articles from journalists who are just doing a cursory overview of stuff, and they're probably not looking into updated material, and they're probably not keeping up with the current conversations that Shroud researchers are actually having right now, which is why... If you Google the Shroud of Turin, you're automatically going to see stuff about the carbon dating, which we will talk about tonight. You're automatically going to see stuff about, you know, some letters that were passed around a few centuries ago that saying it was a fake. We won't be talking about those letters tonight. We'll be talking about those at the part two session in two weeks because that's part of the historical portion. But that's the kind of stuff you're going to get if you just Google it, because a lot of this really good information just hasn't made its way out into the, the Google universe, the common, the common Google universe yet. So with all the credits out of the way here, let's get started. Now, for anyone who's not completely, who doesn't understand the concept of the Shroud of Turin, the idea is that after Jesus was crucified, he was taken off of the cross, he was taken into the tomb, unlike how this picture shows, but he was taken into the tomb and he would have been laid on a cloth on his back and then that cloth would be draped over the top of his head, as this picture shows, so that it's draped over him vertically but he's also lying on it vertically underneath. That is the concept of the Shroud of Turin. And that is why it looks kind of strange when people see the whole thing for the first time. Generally, people only see the face or the front portion of it, and they don't realize that it's, it's a whole long linen cloth. So here's a picture of it from 2020. This is Pope Francis standing in front of the entire Shroud of Turin in Turin, Italy. Now, Pope Francis is five foot seven, and the man on the shroud would have stood approximately five foot ten. But that is the entire shroud. That's kind of how it looks today. Now, this is in the Turin Cathedral in Italy, in Turin, Italy. However, the shroud does not go on public exhibition very often. The Pope wanted it put on display in 2020 because of the COVID crisis, and he wanted to offer people some hope. So it was a very nice thing to do. But the shroud, most of the time, is not on public display anymore. It's a very, very rare occurrence for it to be on public display. But it is kept at the Turin Cathedral in Italy. So is that a projection? No, that's the real thing. And it's just framed? Yeah, it's framed in a, uh, a high-tech case. And is that the permanent location of it, or has it been moved down? They can move it. Yeah, they move it into, like, a, it, they keep it in a secure laboratory. That's, I don't know if it's like behind the cathedral or under the cathedral. The Vatican has a way of doing things like that. <laughs> they have secret laboratories. Now here's a clear full photograph of it. Five pounds. Yeah, surprisingly, it is a very light piece of cloth these days. It only weighs five and a half pounds. It is 14 and a half feet long. It's almost four feet wide. And the reason these dimensions are actually really important is because if the shroud actually comes from the first century, which is where it would have to come from if it truly is the burial shroud of Jesus, 14 and a half feet by three feet nine inches is exactly eight cubits by two cubits, according to the ancient Assyrian cubit. So that's how they would have measured and cut cloth back then back in the first century. So those are very significant numbers. But yes, it is very lightweight. There are four components of the shroud that we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the linen itself, which is a very fine, very rare woven linen. And then we're going to talk about the elemental substances on the cloth, which would be 
the dirt and the, the burn holes in it. Then we're going to talk about the blood stains, and then we're going to talk about the image itself. So you can sort of see in this image here, in this picture, you can see that there is an image of a man, right? And you can see what appear to be blood stains, and you can already tell that the blood stains seem to be rather distinct from the image itself, and that is truly the case. The blood stains do not make up the image itself. So we're going to talk about what the image is. All right, here's a bit of a closer view. This is the full, the full frontal portion of it. And as you can see here, as I said before, the man on the shroud would have been laying on this side, and then this half of it would have been draped vertically over his head. So that's why there's a bit of a space between the, the head images. So, yeah, that's, that's what the entire shroud looks like. Here's a closer image of the back side. You can see that there are significant wounds, bloody wounds on the back that resemble scourge marks. So we're going to talk about those as well. And to give you a very brief overview of the history of the shroud, remember tonight is not about the entire history of the shroud because we don't have time to go into the entire history. But the official history of what we now know as the Shroud of Turin began in 1355. Now back then it was only called the Holy Shroud because it wasn't in Turin, it was in France. And it was owned by the de Charny family who had ties to the Knights Templar back then. They began to put this thing, this Holy Shroud as they called it, on public display in Lyry, France. They made a bunch of money off of it actually. <laughs> I don't, well, I don't know if they made a bunch of money, but we actually have little medallions that they used to sell back then, like gift shop items, that were shaped like the entire shroud, the back and the front portions. And they would make money off of selling these little, these little gifts to people and to letting people come see it for, a, for an admission fee. And so that is the first time that this thing officially ends up in the history books, is to say, okay, where did these people get this thing? And now they're putting it on display and they're, they're selling, you know, tickets to, to come see it. Well, then in 1453, the shroud was moved to the Saint Chapelle in Chambery, France, because the de Charny family gave it away to the uh, church there. And uh, that was 100 years later. Then almost another 100 years later, in 1532, the Saint Chapelle almost entirely burns down. And the shroud is actually burned on its corners, but it is patched by Chambery's Poor Clare nuns. And they sewed what we call the Holland cloth onto the back of the shroud to preserve its form. So typically when you're looking at pictures of the shroud, because it is itself so thin, there is another cloth sewn onto the back of it to help preserve its form. And they also repaired portions of the shroud around the edges, which is going to be very relevant when we start talking about when it was carbon-14 dated. Uh, so just keep that in your mind, too. And furthermore, we know that there are... So, so these triangular pieces you see here, those are the burn marks from when it was in that fire in, in the 1500s. It was folded up, and the corners of it, while it was folded, got burned, and they got burned off. So consequently, Whatever portions of the image were originally there are no longer there. They've been burned off, uh, so we no longer have those. However, the Holland cloth on the back of it makes it look like it's still part of the shroud, but it's, it's just those are holes in the shroud itself. That's the cloth on the backside. And then in 1578, the shroud was moved to the Cathedral of Turin in Italy, which is where it has remained almost permanently ever since. It has only very rarely been taken out of the Cathedral of Turin, and I don't think it's been taken out of the Cathedral of Turin since World War II. I'm going to confirm that, because I, I have heard that it was taken out of Turin and hidden from Hitler, actually, during World War II, but it did eventually make its way back to Turin, and it has been there for a century now. That would be a reasonable reason. Yeah, it's a pretty good reason to, to, to hide your ancient relics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so that is a very brief history of the Shroud 
as we know it today. Like if you Google history of the shroud, it's going to land you in 1355. And that's because we don't know, as I'll explain in part two in two weeks, we don't know where the shroud was for at least 200 years before 1355. There's a gap. But if you go back 200 years, we start to have some pretty good indications of where this thing might have been. It was just going by different names. But that's for two weeks from now. And it's all very fascinating. All right. In 1899, the very first photograph of the shroud was taken on May 28th. It was taken by an Italian photographer named Secondo Pia, and he was given special permission by the King of Italy, and the King of Italy owned the shroud at that time. He was given special permission by the King of Italy to photograph the shroud for the very first time. So Secondo Pia took the photos around 9.30 p.m. after a public exhibition, and then he went to develop the pictures in his dark room around midnight. Now, when he saw the pictures that he took, when he saw the photo negatives of the pictures that he took, he nearly dropped the glass plates, because back then photographs were taken on glass plates. He nearly dropped the glass plate when he made an astonishing discovery about the picture that he had taken. And I'll tell you what that discovery was in just a moment. But for his controversial discovery, Pio was actually criticized and scrutinized for many, many years for supposedly doctoring his photographs or for using a poor technique. So he was persecuted because of these photographs that he took of the shroud. Everybody thought that he had faked them. However, in 1931, another photographer took additional photographs of the shroud with more improved photographic techniques, and they came out the same. They came out with the same results. So Pio was actually vindicated in 1931. Uh, 30 years after he took his photographs, and reportedly he sighed a very deep breath of relief. <laughs> so his story is very interesting. But what did he discover when he took his pictures? What did he find the first time he photographed the shroud? All right, just in case we have anyone here who is too young to remember having to get film developed for pictures, what used to happen was when you took a picture on film, or in Secundo Pia's case on a glass plate, you would get an undeveloped photo negative because of the way that the light is captured on the photographic medium. And you would have to take the image into a dark room where there was no light exposure, and it usually had a very limited light in the dark room, in order to expose the picture and develop it into its positive image. So what happened was, this is how the shroud appears to the naked eye. If you stand in front of the Shroud of Turin, this is what you're going to see. Now you can already tell the image is pretty faint, and that is how it's going to look if you look straight at it. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see a whole lot of detail. And the reason for that is that the image is actually fading. Now I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's very hard to see with the naked eye the image. In fact, the farther away you're standing, the easier it is to see the image. And there's a reason for that, too, that I'll mention a little later. So when Secondo Pia took his photographs, he expected to see, obviously, a photo negative of the shroud, because that's what you get. However, when he looked at his photo negative, he realized that the shroud image became a photo positive. So when you look at the photo negative of the Shroud of Turin, the image on the shroud becomes a photo positive. And this astonished him so much that he almost dropped the glass plate that had the picture on it. <laughs> huh? Uh, this isn't his, no. This is a higher resolution than his was. But I mean, but he was looking at the same thing, basically. And by the way, I did this myself. I found this picture online, and then I copied it right here, and I applied a negative photo filter to it. And you get this. Now, what he noticed, the reason this was so astonishing, is not just because the image was rendered as a positive, but also because so much more detail becomes apparent. It becomes so much easier to see the image of the man. It's just so much 
it's so much clearer. It's so much more detailed, more defined. And there are so many things that you can tell. Like, for example, when you look at this, you get a sense that there's a face there and that it's a man with, with hair and a beard, right? But when you look at this image, you get a much better concept of the shape of his face, his forehead and his eyebrows, the shape of his nose, the shape of his cheekbones, his mouth, even his lips, details in the hair, the way the hair is falling over the shoulders and also behind the shoulders. And of course, much greater detail on his wounds as well, including the wounds on his head. And this was so astonishing to people when they saw these pictures that they literally accused Secunda Pia of having doctored the photographs because they didn't believe that this much detail would be apparent on the Shroud of Turin in looking at the photo negative. So again, this is what the Shroud looks like face to face. And you'll notice this very distinct blood stain on the forehead, by the way, that when you're looking at it this way, it looks like an E, right? Just keep that in mind. It's a very interesting detail. It's very, it's very distinct. And this is what that image looks like negated. You can see how much more detail shows up and how much, how much easier it is to see and, and, and just read the image in your mind. It's, it's astonishing. And this is my personal favorite detail about the shroud. And the reason is because, and we'll get more into this in two weeks, this concept of photonegativity didn't exist until the invention of photography. There is no artist in history who has ever created a picture or a painting or a drawing of any kind that resembles photonegativity before the invention of photography. So if the Shroud of Turin was created by a medieval artist, someone in the 1200s or 1300s, they would have had to have come up with this photonegativity concept to begin with, and then they would have had to have created the shroud in such a way that if you could look at it as a photonegative, you would see even more details than you can see with the naked eye. So the fact that this is the case, it seems to speak against it being made by an artist. So the, this incredible uh, level of detail that's visible in the photo negatives of the shroud as the shroud image itself is rendered a positive is one of the greatest mysteries of the shroud. It's just, it's just the most astonishing thing. It's baffling. Nobody can explain it. There are no explanations. There are no theories. You can look this up all you want. You can read any art history book that you want. You're not going to find an explanation for this. And it's one of the most, I think, one of the most overlooked details of the shroud when skeptics try to attack it, is that there's no explanation for this. The best thing a skeptic can say is that whoever created the shroud was an artistic genius. But what, but what an objection <laughs> that it's like a human could do this if they were a genius. But the thing is, is that artistic genius in the medieval times wouldn't have even had a way that we know of to even look at the shroud as a photo negative, thus rendering it a positive. So how on earth could this have been done? Consider what it would take for a medieval artist to create something like this that wouldn't even be visible to anyone for another 500 years. I mean, this is literally how you get time travel conspiracy theories. <laughs> People literally say, oh, well, maybe a time traveler created it like 300 years from now, and then they dropped it off back in the 1300s, you know? <laughs> I mean, I guess that's as valid a crazy theory as any, right? <laughs> it's like, if you're going to embrace the supernatural, you might as well just go with, you know, Jesus. But why do I know? <laughs> so, syndonology, is that a science of shroud artifacts or this yes. artifact only? Shroud artifacts. So yeah, Secundopia's first photographs of the shroud were the beginning of modern scientific research on the shroud, now known as syndonology. Syndonology is literally the science of the Shroud of Turin. This particular artifact only? This particular one, there is another one that I'm going to mention in a little while. But yes, generally speaking, syndonology is the study of the Shroud of Turin. But yeah, so these first photographs were the beginning of syndonology, and this is when modern people finally took notice of the Shroud of Turin as a potential 
actual miracle. And a lot of hype grew around the shroud very fast. Obviously, in 1931, more photographs were commissioned, and those photographs affirmed what Secunda Pia had already captured. So that was when a lot of research began on the Shroud of Turin, but obviously because it was privately owned at the time, they didn't want to grant access to just anybody to come look at it, which was their prerogative, of course. And I am personally thankful that the House of Savoy and, and now the Catholic Church have kept the Shroud of Turin very safe for many, many years. So, you know, we, we should be thankful for that because it really is just an astonishing relic. Well, in 1978, about 70 years after Secundo Pia took his first photographs, a large team of more than 30 scientists called the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or we just say STIRP, was granted special permission from the Catholic Church to have unprecedented scientific access to the Shroud to conduct an extensive 120-hour hands-on investigation. The STIRP team consisted of Catholics, Protestants, Jewish people, and agnostic researchers. So it was a very diverse team from all different backgrounds, a lot of different scientific fields and areas of specialty. I'm going to show you some pictures from 1978. This is Barry Schwartz, who now runs Shroud.com. He was one of the official photographers. And they did all kinds of stuff with the Shroud in those 120 hours. Over those 120 hours, basically five days straight, they worked in shifts so that there was never a moment that there wasn't somebody working on the shroud. And they did this so that they can maximize their time and gather as much data as possible. They took floodlight photographs of the shroud. In other words, they propped it up so that they could light it from behind, which makes it a lot easier to look at and research. So they took photographs of it that way, lots and lots, thousands of photographs. They took x-rays of the shroud, low-power x-rays. They took ultraviolet photographs of the shroud. They, they shine ultraviolet light on it to see if that would reveal anything, particularly biological and microbiological. They took sticky tape samples from the surface of the shroud. They unstitched one side edge of the shroud to look between the shroud and the backing cloth, which was the first time that had been done in over 400 years. They obtained blood stain samples from the lumbar region, so from the, the back of the shroud. They took blood stain samples from the back, from the back of it. And then they took thousands and thousands of photographs and micro photographs. So most of the time when you're looking at high resolution pictures of the shroud today, you are actually looking at photographs from 1978 that were taken on film back then because nobody's been allowed to get that close to it ever since. <clears throat> well, except for one other time, which was when they took the, uh, the sample for the carbon-14 uh, dating test. But that didn't take as long. So over five days, they conducted all these tests. You, you can see them very carefully moving it with gloves and everything. They have, you know, the church had been keeping it on this sort of uh, some kind of like felt cloth they were keeping it safe as best they knew how, very safe away from the public, and this was a huge deal. You can see they used all, they brought in all kinds of scientific instruments, but they took photos of the shroud all over the place at every scale. They were always incredibly careful with it, incredibly gentle. As soon as all of those researchers walked into the room and they looked at the shroud, they automatically knew that they were dealing with something that was incredibly special and that was unlike anything that they had ever seen before. It became immediately obvious to them that this was not going to be a quick process to determine the origins of the shroud and how it came to be. So after five days straight of working on this ancient relic, I bet you're wondering what the results were. <laughs> well, here are the results. They expected to walk in and scrape the paint off of the shroud and call it a day. That's what they expect. They expected to just go in and say, this is clearly a painting. Uh, there's paint residue all over it, and we can just call it for what it is. It's a clever work of art, but it's just a painting. That's what they expected to do. 
What they found instead was that there's not a single drop of paint on the shroud at all. That the image itself is not made of any kind of paint, no kind of dye, no stains, no inks, no acids, no pigments, no powders, no substance that an artist would use was used to make the image. And furthermore, they confirmed that the image itself, as I've already told you, is not made of the blood stains. The blood stains are separate from the image itself. This is an image of the blood stains. Clearly, it looks like blood stains. This is a picture of what the image looks like close up. And if you can't tell what's even going on here, I'll explain that in a minute. There is no substance, no external substance causing the image and there is no substance binding the fibrils together to make the image. So for example, you can see how the blood is, is bound between, it's, it's binding the, the fibers, right? It's stuck in there because that's what blood stains do. However, with the image itself, there is nothing binding the fibers together. It's just the fibers themselves. So how then is the image made if there's nothing binding them together? Well, for one thing, the image itself is only one fibril deep. So each fiber of the shroud, obviously, is made of even smaller fibrils, okay? The image only rests on the topmost fibrils of the fibers of the shroud, and there's no bleed through at all. The shroud image is only on that side of the shroud. It's not on the other side. And it's only on the topmost fibrils of the topmost fibers of the shroud. And there's no bleed through. This is absolutely astonishing. So what you're seeing here are images from, I believe, the tip of the nose. These slightly darker fibrils are the image fibrils. And the lighter ones is just how the cloth is on its own. Can, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So you're saying there's no bleed through? There's Are no bleed through. That makes it look more authentic? Or, or how does that... What do you mean? Well, t tell me if, it, if, there, if, the, if the blood has not been bled through the shroud, through the fabric. The blood does come through the shroud. You can clearly see how the blood stains have bled through to the, the back side of the so shroud. It's only on one side. Only the image. The image of the man is only on the one side. And you're saying that that makes it more authentic to an archaeologist? It makes it a greater mystery to a scientist because any, any substance that an artist would have used to create an image like that, like paint or ink, would have bled through the fibers very easily, but it didn't. So whatever caused the image only affected the topmost fibrils, the, the very tippy top strings on top of the shroud on that one side. So it's really quite incredible. Here's a much closer look at that. But you can see the distinction between these slightly darker fibrils and the lighter ones underneath. So it's more fascinating to the scientists because it's unnatural. It's very unnatural. Okay. Nobody has ever seen anything like this before. Yeah. All right, so they paid a lot of attention as well to this fact about the shroud that had been known for a long time, which is that the image is better seen from a distance than close up. They wanted to know why that is the case. Could there be a scientific explanation for this? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. The explanation is that the image shading, the shading of the image is based on the proximity of the image fibrils to each other not on the darkness of the fibrils themselves. So if you've ever seen a drawing like this or a painting like this where it's all done with using dots, you can see that there's an illusion of darkness and brightness in the drawing itself. But the truth is, is that every dot has an equal amount of darkness to it, even if some of the dots are slightly smaller. Every dot has equal darkness. But the closer the dots are together, the more it gives us an illusion of being darker than the portions of the drawing that are lighter. This is how the shroud works. The image fibrils that, that actually have the image on them are not actually darker or lighter than each other. It's just that the darker portions are actually closer to each other than the others. 
each affected image fibril has roughly the same shade. So let's look at this again. I, I'm pretty sure this is from the tip of the nose, and the nose is one of the darker portions on the image. What this means is that the reason that the nose appears darker than other parts of the image is because these image fibrils are closer together to each other. It's not because the nose image fibrils are actually darker, it's because they're just closer to each other. If you go to a lighter portion of the image, the fibrils are going to be farther away from each other. All of the image fibrils are roughly the same shade as they are. So, if this was done by a human artist, not only were they a genius, they must have had some kind of supernatural power, honestly. I mean, there's, there's just no other way to explain it. Consider the implications that this has for the negative shading that we've already talked about. This is how it appears to the eye, although this photograph's a little doctored, so it, you can see it a little more clearly. But the shroud itself is a photonegative, and photonegativity didn't exist until the invention of photography. So if a medieval artist did this, not only did they invent photonegativity, they also invented whatever process this is for affecting only the topmost fibrils and then having the lightness and darkness of the image be dependent on the proximity of the fibrils to each other and not the darkness of the fibrils themselves. That is already, we're only at the beginning of this presentation, <laughs> and that is already just impossible. How would you even begin to do this? Now, attempts have been made to reproduce the shroud in this way, and we will talk about some of those toward the end of tonight's presentation but we have a lot more to talk about. They use the mass spectrometer to analyze how much organic material is on the shroud. Because obviously, if the image is not paint, if it's not something an artist would use, their next guess goes to what's called a decomposition stain. Now, I almost put pictures of decomposition stains in this presentation, but they're incredibly gross. So you'll have to look those up yourself some other time. But when a dead body begins to decompose on a surface after a few days, it starts to leave a decomposition stain. However, decomposition stains as we know them do not have the level of detail that the Shroud of Turin has, but they still wanted to check for that sort of thing anyway. But what they ended up finding was that no aloes, no oils, no proteins, no myrrh, no natural substance that could have caused the image by contact with a dead body is on the Shroud. There is no decomposition stain on the shroud, and the image is not a decomposition stain. So, if the image has a purely natural cause, one would expect other images on other burial cloths to have been found. But nothing like the Shroud of Turin has ever been found. Nothing has even come close to looking like the Shroud of Turin. And on the shroud, there, is, there are no signs of body decay at all. There are blood stains, yes, but there's no sign that the body that was inside the shroud ever decayed. Now, do you know a story about a man who died but never decayed? <laughs> I do. His name was Jesus. He lived in the first century. Now, I have been sort of speaking to you tonight as if I'm already presuming that this was Jesus who was the man inside of the shroud. But the truth is, is that I've probably done you a disservice by, by telling you that because... If you want to be objective about the shroud, you need to begin by just assuming, well, this is just a very strange thing. How do you prove that it's Jesus? To that, for now, I just appeal to your intuition that this man looks like what, how we think Jesus looks. He has the kinds of wounds that Jesus is said to have been afflicted with by the Romans. He has crucifixion wounds. He has scourging wounds. He even has a wound on his side where he's bleeding out the one side, and he has wounds on his head that could be from a crown of thorns. So everything about this image, if it was made by an artist, it was almost certainly made to look like Jesus. The only way this would not be Jesus is if this was produced by natural causes for a different man who was tortured exactly like Jesus. But when everybody sees this image, they see Jesus.
And undoubtedly, as I've already said, if an artist made it, they were trying to portray Jesus. So I'll just appeal to your intuition on that for now. All right, but more about the science here. So what is the image made of then? If it's not made of anything an artist would use and it's not made of any natural substances from decomposition, then what makes up the image? Well, as Eric Jumper says, who is the man right here in this photograph from the original STIRP team, and he's a physicist, he said, the conclusions are that the body image is made up of yellowed surface fibrils of the linen that are at a more advanced stage of degradation than the non-image linen. No evidence was found in the body image of any added substances that could have contributed to the yellow color of the fibrils that formed the image. The data taken together do not support the hypothesis that the images on the shroud are due to an artist. So what is he saying here? What does he mean that the surface fibrils are at more advanced stages of degradation? What does that mean? It means that they're aged more. So the shroud image is composed of hyper-aged fibrils. Here again is the difference between image fibrils and blood stains. As you can see, blood stains look very much like blood stains. It's very messy. There's a lot of binding between the fibers. But with the image fibrils, it's all very neat and tidy. It's very organized. And it's very clean. So the cellulose comprising the fibrils has undergone a dehydrating, oxidizing reaction, causing it to age faster than the others. These are the image fibrils. They have aged faster than all of the other fibrils on the shroud. Newer research refined the cause of the darker color to be caused by existing carbon atoms in the cellulose molecules in the flax fibers being changed from single to double electron bonds. What this means is that radiation changed the carbon bonds on the shroud and formed the image. That's the best explanation we have for how the image ended up on the shroud. Radiation changed the carbon bonds in the topmost fibrils of the shroud. So that's how the image was formed. Somehow, radiation caused these topmost fibrils to be hyper-aged. They have literally become older than the other fibers. And if you recall me telling you a little while ago that the image on the shroud has started to fade over time, the reason is because the rest of the fibers on the shroud are catching up in age to the age of the fibrils themselves. So in a sense, the, the shroud of Turin is, the picture is fading, much like a, an old Polaroid photograph. But isn't this remarkable that the only explanation they can come up with for how the image got onto the shroud is through radiation. Now, how did that work? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, as for how the image was projected onto the shroud, the question is, is, is the image then a product of coming in contact with the body, or is there something else going on? Well, there is a complete lack of directionality to the image which means that it was not made using brush strokes or pastel streaks or finger smudging or shading. So even when you look at the fibrils, you can see that there's no signs of artistic technique being used on it. It seems that the image was projected vertically from the body onto the linen. So the image was not produced by contact with the body. And this means that there are parts of the image that were projected through empty space onto the shroud. So the image had to have been projected vertically because the top of the man's head and his sides are not featured. So if you remember, there's that space between the head images that's not there. That's because the image was not projected above his head, so to speak. It was projected vertically through the body. But also it seems that however the image was made, it came from the body itself because the image on the shroud as I've already said, is not on the other side of the shroud. It's not on the outside of the shroud. So when the image was formed, hypothetically, if you were watching the image being formed, 
you wouldn't see anything happening on the outside of the shroud. It was all happening inside of the shroud because there's no bleed through for the image. Now, there is a theory called the fall through hypothesis that states that they think that the image was formed when the man disappeared from the shroud and the shroud fell through his dematerializing body. There have been claims from some scientists that they think that there is a very, very faint image on the back side of the shroud. However, what's interesting about their claims is that it's not a mirror image of the image that's already there, it's something else. They claim that he looks more alive. Now, I've seen those pictures where they have claimed that this is what that looks like. I think it's very hard to make out. I think it's a bit sensationalized. There are some interesting things to the fall through hypothesis though as just a theory for how the image got on there. It's just the, the idea of there being an image on the other side. That's the part that I'm not really sure about. Why would but, there be an image on the other side? I don't know. Because however the image was made, it would have ended up, if it went through his body, if the radiation was coming through the body, then it would have ended up on the back side eventually somehow. But the bottom line is, is that the image is definitely mostly on just the inside of the shroud and whatever's on the backside is, is next to nothing. So there have been different theories proposed for how this projection may have happened. There, there's basically three options. Was it that the image was projected perpendicularly from the skin onto the shroud, which is what this shows? I know that might be a little hard for y'all to see. Was it projected perpendicularly off of the skin or was it intentionally projected so that it hit the shroud perpendicularly, or did it simply come vertically straight up off of the body without any regard for the position of the skin or the position of the shroud? Based on all the analyses that have been done, the answer is the third option, which is that it was projected vertically straight up onto the shroud and vertically straight down onto the shroud, and there are no images on the side or the top portion of the head, or from underneath the feet for that matter. So what that means, as I already mentioned, is that there are parts of the image that were projected through empty space that did not come in contact with the cloth itself. And we know this because when you look at the face, there are obviously portions of the face that all could not have been in contact with the cloth at the same time, if you grant that, you know, his nose was a normal nose or that, you know, his face is a normal kind of face. It's like there are just parts of the shroud that could not have been touching those, those parts of him. So they had to have been projected through empty space. Now, portions of the shroud that were in contact with the body are a little darker. However, that's the next interesting portion. The image doesn't seem to be weight dependent it doesn't seem like the weight of the shroud on top of the body mattered to the image or the weight of the body on top of the shroud matters to the backside. It doesn't seem to matter. The thing that seems to matter is the distance from the shroud to the body. Because if the image is being projected off of the body onto the shroud through empty space, it's actually the distance between the shroud and the body itself that is creating the variation in dark and light in the image. Granted that the image fibers themselves are not actually darker or lighter, it's the proximity of them that's being affected. So the shroud image is weight independent. And when the image was transferred onto the cloth, it, it was not transferred to the other side of the cloth. It was strictly produced only on the fibrils very closest to the body, not by contact with those fibrils. Yeah. Okay, so was he floating? <laughs> oh, the question is, was he floating? There is actually an answer to that that I will get to in a moment. Can you so define so projecting for me, too? <laughs> sure. When you say projecting the, the, from the body to the shroud, what is projecting? What do you mean by that? There was light coming from the body projected onto the shroud. So they, they think that the, the image on the inside of the shroud is a light imprint? Yes. It's not a blood thing. It's different. The image was formed by light coming from the body. Light coming from the body. 
light is radiation. Oh, okay. So radiation this light makes them believe this is more authentic Malwitz. Well, it's certainly a miracle. Okay. Now, I'm is it the actual burial shroud of Jesus? That is a slightly different question. But the scientific question is, can this be explained naturally or can it be produced by humans? And so far, the answer is increasingly becoming no. All right, so with this in mind, that the image on the shroud was projected onto the shroud, what this means is that the image on the shroud is actually a mirror image of the man. So the image can be horizontally reversed like a mirror to reveal how the man would have appeared in real life. So the distinct E bloodstain pattern on the forehead becomes a three. And what this means is that it's actually the left hand covering the right hand and the side wound is on the right side of the body. This is really just more interesting than anything. I mean, I don't think the Bible says that he was pierced in his, in his right side. But the fact of the matter is, is if the image was projected onto the shroud, then this is how he would have looked in real life, that the shroud image itself is actually backwards. Are you saying that the three, that you're not, they're not saying that that has a significance, do they? As a character? Or just, it well, just looks like a three, they're saying it looks like a three. Well, they're not, nobody is saying that somebody created this as a three. It just seems significant that if this is Jesus, then three could be an indication of Trinity, or as an E, it could be an indication of Elohim, which would have been their word for God back then. So it goes both ways. It could go both ways. It's more interesting than anything. There's an artistic intuition that comes to this that helps you see this as Jesus. All right. Moreover, to make things even more astounding, the shading of the shroud image makes it possible to extract a three-dimensional model using digital data. Normal photographs do not produce this kind of image data. You would think that they would, but the shading on photographs is strictly two-dimensional. This is kind of hard to explain, but the fact of the matter is, is that the image data on the shroud is three-dimensional. You can extract it because of the way that it was projected from the body onto the shroud based on its distance from the cloth, you can therefore create a three-dimensional model of the man using the data on the shroud. And this has been done probably ad nauseum at this point. I mean, it was absolutely revolutionary the first time uh, somebody did it, but now it's been done to the extent where you end up with these incredibly realistic 3D models of the man. So this is called The Mystery Man. It's a hyper-realistic artistic work made of latex and silicone, and it's based on the three-dimensional information encoded in the Shroud of Turin. And the, the exhibition curator, Alvaro Blanco, worked with a team of artists and scientists for 15 years to create this model, which uses real human hair. It is currently on display at the Cathedral of Salamanca in Spain, but they plan to tour churches with it for the next 20 years. And this is an incredibly, incredibly realistic looking model. Here is a close up of the face. Um, it's, it, it's quite shocking. Um, these, these, these pictures are worth dwelling on for a long time, especially for, for spiritual purposes, I think. But. Um, but for, for, for tonight, I have to keep moving. So many digital images of the man on the shroud have been created, and the History Channel actually commissioned a digital artist named Ray Downing for their really excellent documentary, The Real Face of Jesus, in 2010. It's funny because, you know, the History Channel is kind of notoriously liberal, and they are always coming up with the weirdest theories to try to explain biblical stories like the Ten Plagues and all that stuff. But what's really fascinating is if you watch this documentary, The Real Face of Jesus, even the History Channel is left absolutely speechless. They have no explanation for this. The best they can say is that it was some kind of supernatural event, but they won't come out and say that it was Jesus. So even the History Channel has been silenced by the Shroud of Turin. And so if this is Jesus 
we have a very good idea of what his face actually looked like on Earth. And it's rather astounding. It's also worth pointing out for the time being, too, that as long as, as long as you color his hair brown and you give him brown eyes, he looks very Middle Eastern. Because one of the common objections to the shroud is that he kind of looks European. He kind of looks like a, almost like a, an old like crusade knight or something. And that's really just an illusion of the, the whiteness of the negative image, making the hair look white. Plus, anybody who's seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, like he kind of looks like the Crusade Knight from the end of Indiana Jones. So there's an illusion that plays out there. But if you take all of the three-dimensional data and you use that to create a realistic model and then you color the hair brown because he was young and you give him brown eyes because he's Middle Eastern, he's Middle Eastern. He's clearly Middle Eastern and there's nothing about his complexion that contradicts that. In fact, he looks quite Jewish. And so it really is very astounding. So what is the best explanation for the image on the shroud? I have told you a lot of really incredible things about the image now. So what is the consensus among scientists, most scientists, for how the image got on the shroud? The best explanation is a sudden, short, vertical burst of radiation emitted from the body itself. There was a body lying inside the shroud, bleeding onto the shroud, and a sudden, short, vertical burst of radiation light went off and left this incredible, one-fibril-deep, radiation-hyperaged image on the shroud of Turin. And the body disappeared. Now, why did the body disappear? Because there are no blood-stained smudges to show that the body was ever pulled out. All the blood stains are stationary. Body disappeared? The body seems to have disappeared. Like it teleported? Yeah. All right, let's talk about the blood. The blood stains on the shroud have been proven to be real human blood. Moreover, the blood type is AB positive. I confirmed this today because somebody challenged me on that earlier. They thought it was AB negative, but I have found that it was definitely AB positive. It also contains Y chromosomes, indicating that it came from a man. The blood is very real, and it definitely came from a man who was clearly tortured because he was bleeding all over. Here's a chart of all of the different blood stains on the frontal image. The shroud image was not produced underneath the blood stains. So if you lift up the blood stains and look underneath them, there is no image portion. Even where it appears like there might have been image underneath the blood, there is not an image underneath the blood stains. This means that the image was projected onto the linen after the blood was already on the cloth. That is an incredibly important detail when you're trying to reproduce the shroud. We'll talk about that a little later. Did you have something? Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah. Would not the radiation still cause a change in the um, on the blood of the blood stain fibers? Well, you would think so. I mean, the truth is, is that blood has probably come off of the shroud since mm -hmm. then. Uh, originally, as the man was bleeding onto the shroud, the blood was almost certainly much thicker. And that's why it wouldn't have got onto the shroud underneath it. But there are also theories that potentially why there might not be smudging of the blood stains is because maybe possibly, potentially, when that radiation burst went off, it cauterized the blood stains themselves, causing them to dry. They have never been able to extract any kind of DNA from the blood. It's all far too degraded at this point. Now, I'm not saying that that's because of the radiation, but it's just the age, the age of the cloth. All right, so there are only blood stains where the linen came in contact with the body, and the blood stains are weight dependent, which is why the dorsal image has much thicker blood stains than the frontal image. And again, the blood stains actually came in contact with the body. I mean, the man was almost certainly bleeding all over, as you can see, but it was only where it came in contact with him is where the is where the blood stains were made. So the blood stains on the back half are thicker, 
And since the source of the image must have been light emitted vertically from the body itself, the image was most likely formed while the shroud covered the bleeding man. So in other words, if the light came from the body, which seems to be where it came from, then it means that the man had to have been bleeding onto the shroud when the image was made, when the image was produced. Here, in this image, you can actually see a crossover between the, the blood stain and the image fibrils. You can see that there's a little bit of blood here on the tip of the nose and that it intersects with the image fibrils. But when you look at the, uh, the, the blood stains, there's no image. There are no image fibrils underneath the blood stains. Again. All right. Now, furthermore, the blood on the shroud came from a man with fresh crucifixion wounds. The man was flogged with a Roman scourge. We know what Roman scourges looked like. We know how big they were. We know the size of the pellets that were used on them. And these scourge marks on the man are outlined with serum, fibrin, and white blood cells because the blood was trying to clot. And these elements are only in blood stains when the, when the blood stains are fresh out of a bleeding wound not if you just gathered some blood and poured it onto a cloth. And these serums that are only in fresh blood wounds, they're only visible under ultraviolet light, which means that not only would a medieval artist had to have known that there was extra substance in the blood from a fresh wound versus a non-fresh wound or non-fresh blood, but he also would have had to have known that the only way you can see it is with UV light. So this means that the man had fresh, open wounds when the shroud covered him. And furthermore, the blood shows evidence of low oxygen content, which is consistent with asphyxiation, which is actually how you die in crucifixion. In crucifixion, you don't actually die from blood loss. You die from suffocation because you can't breathe, because the weight of your body is being, is being pulled down and you have to push up with your legs in order to breathe. So the man has been asphyxiated, and that is how he died. The blood issuing from his right side wound also contains watery fluid from the pleural cavity of the body, which would be consistent with crucifixion victims. As you start to asphyxiate, water starts to fill up your lungs, and then the nail wounds are actually in the anatomically correct place for a crucifixion, which is in the wrists, not in the palms. And this is, of course, due to the fact that, as the Romans probably learned, if you crucify someone through the palm, the body will fall off because the nail will rip through the rest of the hand. But if you pierce them through the wrist, below the wrist, the body will hold up because the body won't fall through the, the joint in the wrist. Now, that detail would not have been known to a medieval artist because crucifixion was no longer a thing in medieval times. And most medieval paintings depict the, the, the hand wounds, the, the crucifixion wounds, is through the palms. So it would have been very unusual for that time. The thumbs are not visible because they are drawn into the palm due to nerve damage, which is what would happen in crucifixion. If you put a nail through that part of the wrist, the thumb ends up being drawn into the palm. There is a small hint of one of the thumbs on the, the left hand covering the right hand, uh, but it's, it's barely, barely visible. And it's, it's coming from underneath the palm. The body was in rigor mortis when the shroud image was made. Now, rigor mortis is a stiffening of the muscles after death. Now, not to be too crude, but if you've ever driven by any kind of roadkill, like a deer that's been hit by a car, and you have seen that its legs are stuck straight out, almost like you could stand it back up, that is a dead body in the process of rigor mortis. What happens in rigor mortis is that after about two to four days of, of being dead, muscles will return to the position in which they died. So what this means is that the man on the shroud was in rigor mortis, which means that he had been in the shroud for somewhere between two to four days. Yeah. Um, and his muscles had started to, to stiffen 
with rigor mortis, which would return him to the position in which he died. In this case, he died during crucifixion. What this means is that his legs are bent and his shoulders are brought up slightly and his head is slightly tilted up because that's the position that he died in. And you can also see that one of his feet is, is propped up higher than the other one. I'll show you a better picture of the blood stains in the feet a little later on. The truth is, is we can't tell from the shroud because it's, there's not a clear image and the blood stains are too big for us to tell. We can't tell exactly how his feet were crucified. We can't tell whether or not there was one nail through both feet or if there were two nails through each foot. So it's hard to say. But his arms are technically in the correct position for someone who has been crucified. Uh, however, they have probably been tied down. They've probably been tied down close to the body, uh, which is what this, this concept model shows, a possible theory of how the man might have been wrapped in the shroud itself just to keep the body in place and to prevent uh, there from being any movement. You'll also notice that there is a cloth tied around the head vertically to keep the mouth closed. And if you will just keep that cloth in mind for a little while, we're going to return to that cloth in a little bit. Piece. Yes, there is. So rigor mortis is why the man's knees are slightly bent and his head and his shoulders are leaned up and his arms are extended because this is the position in which he would have died on the cross. And it's very possible, so there is actually a side strip that is sewn onto the, the side of the shroud. It was sewn onto the shroud at an unknown time, but we believe that it was probably also used as part of the wrapping process. It's not part of the backing cloth that was sewn onto the back of the shroud. It's on the side of the shroud itself. When you look at a whole photograph, you can see it very clearly. So. So your question about was the body floating, no, the body was not floating, it was in rigor mortis. The muscles on the back side had stiffened to the point where they appeared as if they were alive, but it was hardened to the point where it looks like parts of the man are, are sitting up. In fact, it looks so much like he's sitting up that some people have even theorized that this is actually an image of when the man came back to life and started to get up. But it does seem like he was probably in, in rigor mortis. That seems to be the case. All right, so here's a bit of a closer look at the scourge wounds, which are very explicit. And the longer you look at those, especially on the back, on the upper torso, it's, um, it's fairly excruciating to imagine. It brings back scenes from the Passion of the Christ. This is the dorsal. Yes, this is the dorsal image. You can also tell, it's worth noting too, that the man had long, somewhat long hair. So he has a portion of hair that comes down to about here on his back, and then he has another portion of hair on the front side that comes down uh, about as low as his, uh, his beard. So he had long hair. And you can see that there are terrible blood stains on the head from what appear to be a crown of thorns. All right, take one more good look at the shroud here. Oh, here's what I wanted to show you with the feet. You can tell that the feet are somewhat separated here, but there's just not a good image. There's not a good enough image, and the blood stain is too explicit on the bottom of the right foot to tell exactly where the crucifixion wound is coming from. It looks like maybe it could be coming from the side of the left heel over here, and we do have some remains of other people who were crucified around that time where there's there's one where there is a, a nail straight through the heel joint. So that is a possibility. Nevertheless, you can tell it was an incredibly painful, pain, incredibly painful wound, and there was a lot, a lot of blood. So yes, the longer you gaze at the shroud, the more and more you will get a sense of how much terrible pain this man endured given that his wounds were fresh when he was placed in the shroud, he endured an extremely brutal, awful death. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering if somebody was poor enough to be crucified, would they have a shroud? Therefore, is the presence of a shroud for a, a okay, crucifixion? So I'll, go ahead and, I'll go ahead and mention that now, actually, because I didn't prepare a specific slide for it. But no, 
people back then would have been far too poor to be buried in a shroud like that. A shroud like this, which, is, which has what's called a herringbone weave, which is a very complicated weave and it was very expensive at the time, only a rich man could have provided that. But there is one of those in the story of Jesus' crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich Pharisee. He provided his own stone-cut tomb for Jesus to be buried in, and he provided something like 100 pounds of aloe and myrrh for preparing the body. Now, one of the things we don't know exactly from the biblical account is whether or not that aloe and myrrh was used the night of the crucifixion or if the women were going back on Sunday morning to put all of that on the body then. So we don't know for sure. So that has led to some speculation about how this could have potentially occurred naturally. What's interesting about a theory like that is that it grants that this is the burial shroud of Jesus of Nazareth and that there was something especially brutal and cruel and unusual about the way that he died as a martyr that caused a natural image of his body to be put onto this cloth despite what the rest of the stories of his resurrection might say. So that, that's, that's a bit of an embarrassing argument point for skeptics is, is to say, well, you know, if this is from Jesus, then perhaps the unusual circumstances surrounding his death and quick burial may have contributed to how the image was made. So skeptics have literally been willing to go that far with it. Again, if you, if you dwell on the image on the shroud for a long time, it will overwhelm you with emotion, especially if you are already a follower of Christ. All right, now we're going to start going over some objections to the shroud because we want to be fair. There were some recent tests done that tried to show that the blood flow patterns on the arms are all wrong. But... If you watch these videos that they made, you can, it's just impossible to prove. These tests fail to take into account all the ways that Jesus' body would have been moved and cleaned before being wrapped in the shroud. He was definitely cleaned before they put him in the shroud because otherwise there would just be blood all over it and there would be no room for an image. So the wounds were fresh and it was bleeding, but he was cleaned off, which means that any blood flow patterns that may have been on his arms would have changed from the time that he was on the cross to the time that he was in the tomb. And even once he was in the tomb, who knows how long it took them to clean him off and what the new bloodstain patterns would have looked like. So I, I wouldn't even call this a good try from, from these scientists. I suppose it's a good idea to take a look at it to see what happens, but the truth is, is there's, it's just too chaotic. It's too it's too unpredictable to, to make any real determination based on these blood flow patterns. Now, there is some other evidence that people sometimes pose about the shroud. For example, some people say that you can see first century coins on the eyes and that you can even see enough detail on it to determine that one of these coins actually has a misprint on it, a known misprint that happened in the first century. However, I... Personally, I think, and a lot of other shroud researchers think, that this is just too, it's just too tentative. It's just, it, it's, it's not very easy to see. I'm not even sure that there are coins on the eyes. It could just be that there was, you know, the image was projected off of the eyelids. I, you know, when I look at it, I can see either coins or I can see closed eyelids. I can see it either way. So. I don't tend to use this as evidence, but it is out there. Some people use it, but I, I will grant that I think it's, it's a little shoddy. Also, some pollen samples were recovered from the shroud that supposedly come from all of the historical geographical locations of the shroud that we know of. Jerusalem, obviously. Antioch, Edessa, Constantinople. I haven't told you all about that tonight. France. But this research has never been confirmed because the scientists who began it passed away before he finished, and he was the world pollen expert, so nobody else has gone back to re-examine that as of yet. But it just seems, it seems a little too good to be true, because he also claimed to have found images of flowers on the shroud, images of flowers that are so specific that they only bloom in the springtime in Jerusalem. Again, seems too good to be true,
And also, it doesn't seem to correlate with what we know about the body image, how the image was projected from the body onto the cloth. If there are flowers on the shroud adjacent to the body, then it would seem like there was light coming from the flowers as well. But given that these images are just not very easy to discern, I think there may be a bit of a uh, bit of an illusion going on here. You could probably turn this into any flower that you wanted. So that's what I think about that. Those are evidences that I don't use when I talk to people about them, but I do want to at least acknowledge that they're there. And just to say that, you know, not every argument in favor of the Shroud's authenticity is a good argument. Sometimes you have arguments like this. All right, let's talk about the reproductions that have been attempted. No reproduction attempts have ever succeeded, even under the best laboratory conditions. So a man named Luigi Garlicelli attempted to use an acidic pigment that was rubbed onto the cloth and then it was placed over a subject so that it would create an impression on the cloth. And then the cloth was heated in an oven and then washed off. And what would happen was the pigment would get washed off, but it would leave something of a burn image on the cloth itself. Uh, but there would be no residue, so there wouldn't any, be any, any kind of material left behind. And then he added the blood stains on top of it. And this is the image that he got, which is, you know, all things considered, pretty good. And it even slightly mimics the three-dimensional data that you get from the shroud. So that's interesting. However, it fails in many ways, not just these three, but in several ways. So the pointillistic nature of the image fibrils is not reproduced, as we talked about, that the lightness and darkness of the image is based on the proximity of the fibrils to each other and not the lightness or darkness of the uh, material itself. Moreover, the image is not supposed to be underneath the blood stains. So he overlooked, he overlooked that. I mean, he probably thinks that you could apply the blood first and still use the same technique, but I think that's a stretch. Many people think that's a stretch. And plus, Garlicelli's image was not created by projection. It required contact with the body. So in other words, he had to stand there and dab the subject with the cloth in order to properly get the image onto the cloth, which is why you end up with these really definitive shadow lines around the face like this, because the actual shroud doesn't have those kinds of shadow lines, except for the line that lines the, the hairline. But on the face, you don't get these extremely definitive shadows lining everything. That's because those are the portions where he didn't dab the subject and there was no contact with the body. So his image had to have been made by contact with the body, not by projection. A better attempt was made just a couple of years ago by this researcher, Gary Viken. His is the best reproduction to date, honestly. And, and you can see that, you know, with the subject that he used, he got a very, very close image. And the thing about it is it does actually create digital data that a computer can analyze. So they have figured out artistic techniques that can create the kind of digital data phenomenon that the, that the shroud has on it, but they just haven't been able to duplicate the way that the shroud itself would have been made. Now, Viken specifically designed this experiment so that it could only be done with medieval techniques and substances that would have been available to people. What he did was, it's a multiple exposure tannic acid iron sulfate contact print it also kind of creates a kind of a, a burn onto the surface of the shroud. But the thing is, is that it's formed with ink. It's still an ink stain at the end of the day. And uh, the truth is, is that, you know, as we've already said, number one, he, he didn't pay any heed to the blood stains at all. He didn't add blood stains at all. He didn't pay attention to the fact that there's no image underneath the blood stains on the shroud, and his image wouldn't work that way. His image would create an image on top his technique would create an image on top of the blood stains. Plus, on the shroud, there is no trace of any extraneous substance forming the image. There, there's no ink forming the image. We know that already. It would have bled through. So, again, his technique fails to reproduce the, the extremely thin layer of the topmost fibrils forming the image. My friend, uh, Dr. Adam Brill, who actually lives in Israel, and I'm sure could use our prayers right now, for safety. I actually reached out to him about this. He has a PhD in chemistry, and he said 
As far as I know, given my chemical background, tannic acid and associated organic compounds found in primitive ink, iron sulfate, and other simple ink components cannot, under simple heating conditions, produce the type of image, especially with respect to surface depth found on the Shroud of Turin, especially when no extraneous chemical byproducts of their reactions can be found. In other words, all chemical components in the surface image are sourced from the underlying fibrous material. So, these are the best reproductions that have been attempted to date so far of the Shroud of Turin. And they've managed to get the, the image to look pretty good, but it just doesn't recreate the conditions that the Shroud was made with, which are still incredibly strange conditions. All right, now to the biggest objection of them all, which is that in 1988, a sample was taken from the Shroud of Turin, and it was carbon dated to between the years 1260 to 1390. Now, this is exactly the time when the Shroud first appeared in history, in 1355. So it nailed it in that regard. And this fact is the first thing you're going to see about the Shroud if you Google it right now. You're going to see that in 1988 it was carbon dated to the medieval times, and therefore it must be a medieval hoax. And admittedly, a lot of the STIRP researchers were very disappointed when they originally heard this. However, as some follow-up research has been done over the years, it has come to light that this carbon dating experiment was likely contaminated and botched for several reasons, for a few possible reasons, but one definitive reason. A few of those possible reasons is that there were a lot of disagreements over what method of carbon testing to use, as well as which labs and which scientists and which samples and which journals would get to publish the results. So there are multiple ways of doing this, and there was a lot of bickering and arguing about how it would be done. So there was never any kind of unanimity for how the test would be done. There could have also been possible collusion between the labs. The lab, For example, the labs were supposed to be testing blind. They were supposed to not know which samples were which because they had control samples to use. But it's very likely we know now that they knew which ones were from the shroud. And they also knew the dates of the dummy cloths as well. So, you know, it is a strange coincidence that it dates to precisely the known history of the shroud. After all, carbon dating, I mean, isn't usually exactly that precise. So it would be a very unusual circumstance for the carbon dating to work that well. Also, it's a little conspicuous because after all, if the shroud was put on display in 1355, it had to have been created before that. And so for the carbon dating to indicate that it had, would have had to have been made within 100 years before that, it seems a little frail. It seems like the Descharnies were showing it because it was a mystery to them and they didn't know where it came from. It seems like you need a little more time in history to not know where something came from. So, and also the shroud was in that fire in 1532, which could have altered the carbon dating results. Scientists are a bit divided about whether or not fire could alter the carbon dating. After all, when you do a carbon dating test, you actually do burn up the sample. You burn up the sample to test how much carbon is, is in it. Also, possible enriched carbon monoxide contamination has been considered. It's also likely, I mean, given what we know about how the image was caused, that maybe the radiation that caused the image would also offset the carbon dating itself. So those are all possibilities, but there's one big main reason why the carbon dating test is completely unreliable that we know for sure now. So Shroud researcher Joe Marino proposed that the samples taken were actually contaminated by the French invisible weaving from the nuns who repaired the shroud in 1532. So the shroud was repaired with weaves within its own fibers, not just with the backing cloth. So they sewed the backing cloth on it to hold it together, but then they also repaired the edges of the shroud by sewing pieces of other newer cloth into the shroud then. In 2005, a Shroud skeptic and one of the original STIRP members, Raymond Rogers, he actually affirmed Marino's theory and he renounced the carbon dating results in writing in a scientific journal. So Raymond Rogers was a Shroud skeptic and he has passed away now. 
but he renounced the carbon dating himself and said, no, we can't, we cannot use that any longer. So the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of history behind this carbon dating, a lot of controversy, but it has been determined that it can no longer be trusted. I'm gonna tell you just a little more about that in a moment. In 2015, an alternative dating method that was based on fiber tensile strength actually dated the shroud to uh, 372 AD plus or minus 400 years. That's a more acceptable range, first of all, for a dating technique. And also, if the shroud was from the first century, then this 2015 technique nailed it. So really, really incredible. All right, a little more about the carbon-14. Reasons to reject the carbon-14 date in full. First of all, and this isn't even all the reasons, this is just a, <laughs> this is a brief summary from this article from my friend Eric Pogel, and he has a, a highly detailed analysis of the carbon-14 dating in this article here. It's an incredibly detailed article. So this is just a very brief summary of it. So first of all, the king of Italy said himself that the frayed edges were repaired in 1694. So the edges were frayed and they fixed them. Scientists prior to the 1988 carbon testing had warned that the corners appeared to have non-original material added to them. So this was already something that was known. Also, that corner of the shroud is visibly darker than the rest of the shroud, which indicates that it is probably contaminated if nothing else, definitely from people handling it for so many centuries around the edges. Obviously, they didn't grab the middle of it. They grabbed the edges of it. That's where people have been holding it for so long. Also, they found in the test samples that were taken from the shroud, they found white cotton fibers that had been dyed brown, uh, which is what this picture is. You can see it's white cotton that had been dyed brown and then sewed into the shroud so that it wouldn't appear to be foreign, to the naked eye, it would look to be completely whole. And cotton fibers are not found in the rest of the shroud. That's not what the rest of the, the herringbone weave fibers are made of. Raymond Rogers, the, the, the stirp skeptic, also found vanillin in the test sample that appears to have come from the backing cloth. Also, the test sample was thinner than the rest of the shroud, which indicates that it had been damaged at some point. And also, even the Holland cloth, which is the backing cloth, even that is also different on that corner, indicating that it also was likely repaired at some point. So there are many, many, many reasons for us to conclude, to safely conclude, that the carbon-14 testing of the Shroud of Turin was completely botched by a contaminated sample, specifically by the invisible weaving. So they took it from this corner but it was already contaminated to begin with. So even if the tests were reliable themselves, and there's question about that, the contamination would offset everything. And it would date primarily to the medieval times when this corner was patched on. So if we're gonna have a reliable carbon-14 dating, we're gonna to have to take a much more careful sample from the shroud from unfortunately a much more intrusive place. From the middle of the shroud, we're gonna need a portion without the image from the inside of the shroud, and then a portion with the image to see if the image affects the dating at all. And then you know other samples potentially with blood stains or there are some water stains as well from where the fire was put out on it, just to see if those things affect the carbon dating at all. But obviously this would be incredibly intrusive to the shroud itself. You could potentially take it from the, from the dorsal image side of the shroud and it would be much less intrusive to the, the image on the front, obviously. But um, there's still something that feels, you know, dangerously uh, sacrilegious about that. So that is why people are reluctant to let this be done again until whoever's going to do it gets their act together and knows what they're doing and they know what the plan is so that you don't repeat this entire fiasco again. So undoubtedly there are people working on that right now to try to figure out how is that going to be done. And it will almost certainly be done again. It's just probably gonna be a matter of time. All right, furthermore, with some more dating tests, the Italian scientist Liberato De Caro invented a new dating technique, especially for the shroud, just last year in 2022. 
He used a wide-angle x-ray scattering method to examine the natural aging of the cellulose in the linen. And uh, you can read his explanation here. But the bottom line is what he's testing for is how much of the cellulose has decayed in the uh, cloth samples that were taken. Now, obviously, he was much more careful to examine samples that are actually from the shroud itself, not from these uh, corner samples that were taken, that were carbon dated. And he tested those linens to being exactly 2,000 years old. And what's great about his test is he also tested other ancient cloths that we already know the dates, or the, the ages of, and his testing technique dated them precisely to what we already knew as well, which were 1,400 years and 5,000 years. So, pretty good. yeah, really, really extraordinary stuff. Last I heard on these tests was that, so the initial tests have been done, and he has, last I heard, he sent them off to scientific journals for review. I'm not sure where they are in that review process, but he will have to pass on that new technology to someone else to try it out for themselves to make sure that he's doing it right before all of this can be confirmed completely. But right now it looks really good that the shroud is dating to exactly 2,000 years old. All right, speaking of other cloths, if you read the Gospels, you'll, in the Gospel of John, there's this detail about a head cloth, a handkerchief that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. It actually says that when Peter and John went into the tomb, they found the head cloth lying in a place by itself, folded up. So we know that there was a head cloth. Well, turns out we have it, and it's called the Sudarium of Oviedo. Sudarium is just a fancy word for head cloth, and Oviedo is the city of Oviedo, Spain, which is where the Sudarium is kept. The Sudarium does not have an image on it like the shroud does. However, it does have explicit heavy blood stains. That blood has been tested to type AB positive with Y chromosomes exactly like the shroud. X-ray fluorescence tests determined that dirt traces from the Sudarium match soil samples taken from the Calvary sites in Jerusalem. That test I don't doubt because it was done at a different time by someone by a different researcher. So those dirt traces from the sudarium match the Calvary site in Jerusalem. The president of the Spanish Center of Sendinology, Jorge Emmanuel Rodriguez, says, we have come to a point where it seems absurd to suggest that by happenstance, all of the wounds, lesions, and swelling coincidences on both cloths, logic requires that we conclude that we are speaking of the same person. So here's the verse from John talks about the handkerchief that, been, that had been around his head. Now, the really interesting thing about the sidarium is that our known history of the sidarium goes back as far as the 7th century. Now, if the sidarium covered the same man as the shroud, then the shroud also must be as, at least as old as the 7th century. So, 500 years older than our known history of the shroud would indicate. So there's already a good indication that the shroud is older than that medieval date from the uh, carbon dating. The bloodstain patterns on the sidarium perfectly match the facial proportions on the shroud. So it was likely rolled up diagonally, and you can actually see the creases of where it was rolled diagonally. And it would have been tied up around the head and under the chin to keep the mouth closed during burial, which is why it doesn't have a miraculous image because the image was projected vertically through the body, the sidarium would have, been, would have been perpendicular to the direction of the radiation rays that would have caused the image. Now, when people have tried to match up the bloodstain patterns, they sometimes, they, they tend to see these as eyes, like it went over the eyes, but that's not actually true. We, we know now from better measurements that these are actually dabs from bloodstains coming out of the nose. So they dabbed the one side of the nose and sort of, you know, wiped the blood off the nose. And then they also wiped, wiped blood off the nose from the other side. And they also seem to have taken, uh, used it to wipe off uh, stains from the puncture wounds because this, it also has the same kinds of uh, stains. Uh, 
that the puncture wounds have from the shroud. And again, you can see the diagonal folds. Now it is almost three feet long and nearly two feet wide, so it's actually a little bigger. The cenarium is bigger than it looks in pictures. So it is actually long enough to be able to go around someone's head. So the cenarium is an absolutely critical part of syndenology, even though it's not the shroud. But the fact that the sedarium covered the same man as the shroud is, is nearly indisputable at this point. And again, the fact that the history of the sedarium goes back to the 7th century goes to show that the shroud must be older than our known history takes us back, or the carbon dating. Today, the shroud is preserved in a high-tech reliquary that controls temperature, air pressure, and humidity. Its popularity has grown, which is why it is almost never put on display, but it is kept very safe. Hopefully it will last a very long time. I would like to see it. <laughs> That's, that is my number one bucket list item is to see the Shroud of Turin in person, even if I have to wear a crazy laboratory suit and look at it through this glass case. That's, that's what I want. I, I want to see the Shroud of Turin in person. It's overseen by the Archdiocese of Turin, of the Turin Cathedral. Yeah, so this is what, this is what that laboratory looks like in the, in the Turin Cathedral. Again, I don't know if it's like behind the sanctuary or if it's like underground beneath the sanctuary, but either way, it's pretty cool. And this thing that they have it on too, I think is capable of um, like moving and folding so that they can like prop it up on display. So, you know, they don't have to take it out every time they put it on display. So we've kind of come down to the end of this. There's one more good look at um, the face of the man on the shroud as a photo negative, rendered as a photo positive. This has been doctored a little bit to draw emphasis to the blood stains and some of the lines on the face. But all of these details are on the shroud. Again, remarkably, whoever made this clearly was trying to make this look like Jesus. If this was done by a human artist, they wanted it to look like Jesus. They wanted it to match the story of Jesus. And even if you don't know anything about the shroud, if you saw this image, you would probably think to yourself, that looks like Jesus. And once you see all the crucifixion wounds, that would be confirmed in your mind. So there is something extraordinary about the shroud image that just demands that we acknowledge that we're looking at the face of Christ. Well, what have the skeptics said? Now, Barry Schwartz was raised as an Orthodox Jew, and he was the official Sturp photographer in 1978. And this is what he says about the Shroud now. He says, At the very beginning of my involvement with the Shroud, I was very skeptical about its authenticity. I had no emotional attachment to Jesus and the subject matter because I was raised as an Orthodox Jew. For me, once I came to the conclusion from the science that it was authentic, I came to understand how meaningful it is. This is like a forensic document of the Passion, and for Christians around the world, this has got to be the most significant relic because it accurately documents everything that is told in the Gospels of what was done to Jesus. I think that there's plenty of evidence there to support the belief that this cloth wrapped the body of the historic Jesus. It doesn't speak to whether or not he was the Messiah. Again, that's a test not so much for science, but for faith. Those are the words of Barry Schwartz. So even skeptics of the Shroud have come to the point now where they have come to believe that the Shroud of Turin actually wrapped the crucified, martyred body of Jesus of Nazareth. And that the image that was produced on the shroud was some kind of miracle. Does it prove that Jesus is the Messiah? Does it prove that Jesus is God? Not necessarily, but it proves that something incredibly significant happened in that tomb inside the shroud. And if this is true, that the shroud wrapped the body of Jesus Christ after he had died by crucifixion. And if it's true 
that the image was produced at the moment that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Then consider this. The blood on the shroud is the blood that bought your sin. The blood on this cloth is what made it possible for you to know God personally. This is the blood of the mediator between God and man. This is the blood of the God-man who died for mankind and allowed us entrance to heaven. Which is why <laughs> I get very emotional when I talk about the shroud because I don't see a way around it anymore. The only thing that could convince me that it is a hoax is if somebody could accurately reproduce it and show how a medieval artist or, or anybody from between the year 1 AD to 1000 AD could have created this using just ancient techniques. But it doesn't seem likely because even with all of our science today that we use to research the shroud, even with all of our science, we still can't produce anything even close to what the shroud is. Nothing like it. You'll see these articles pop up every now and then. They'll come across your timeline on Facebook or wherever. And you'll see, oh, the shroud is proven to be a hoax once again. But if you just dig a little bit into that, into whatever they've used to disprove it, it, it never works. I mean, one of the most recent ones that came up again because this, this was a thing a few years ago was one of the skeptics claimed that there were actually red ochre pigments in the blood stains. What are ochre pigments? It would have been paint. And so he claimed that the blood stains were actually paint. Well, there's, there are so many problems with this. Number one, we can detect the serum with UV light on the shroud. So at the very least, somebody did bleed onto the shroud at some point. Now, is it possible that the blood was reinforced at some point with paint just to preserve the way that it looks? It's possible. And furthermore, we have found little, little indications on the shroud that at different points in history, they probably tried to trace paintings of it. They probably put some kind of cloth on top of it and tried to trace it. So, there are actually minuscule fragments of paint on different parts of the shroud. But, see, if you read that in an article, you're going to go, oh, then it's a painting. But no, but you're not getting the full story. We know that the image is not made of paint. Just because there are little bits of paint here and there does not mean that the image is made of paint. Because those little bits and pieces are not what make the image. The image is made by hyper-aged fibrils on the topmost fibers of the shroud on the one side, and it doesn't bleed through. So the skeptics, for all their eagerness to prove it wrong, have just been completely unsuccessful for the better part of 40 years. And until we can get better carbon testing done, and until somebody can create a good reproduction of it, and until we get a solid history of it as well for who may have created it or where it came from, which we don't have, then until then it appears to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. And there's just no other way to put it. The only thing that can stop you from coming to that conclusion is just pure incredulity. You just can't believe it. It's too incredible. And I've been keeping up with this for a long time now. <laughs> and I have never heard anything that made me second guess to any extreme extent in, in the last few years. The evidence is just too remarkable. I suppose the other possibility is perhaps all of these shroud researchers in 1978 got together and the hoax is them. Maybe they all lied all at the same time just to make some money, you know, and they decided, okay, you're going to be the you're going to be the shroud truther and you're going to be the shroud skeptic, you know. In 20 years, you're going to have a website. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, maybe, maybe that's how it happened, you know. Well, okay, I'll grant that possibility. 
but I don't think they're all liars. I think that especially the skeptics have been very, very good and very honest about their research with a few exceptions. But this is why I, the blood on the shroud is the blood that bought your sin, our sins. It's the blood that, that cleanses us of our sin. So that's why I would like to see the shroud. I know that I will see the face of Christ myself one day, and that will be more than enough. But for now, the shroud is a, a very special gift to us. And furthermore, you know, it's worth saying too that we don't even need the shroud. We don't need the shroud of Turin to believe in the resurrection. We have the word of God. We have the Bible. We have the divinely inspired scriptures that come from the first century from people who knew Jesus himself. That's really all we need. That's all that we've had up until now. That is more than enough for our faith to bank on. And I have given lots of presentations about the evidence for the resurrection apart from the Shroud of Turin. I've done plenty of that. So we don't need the Shroud. But the Shroud is definitely the icing on the cake. And it's like, why would God do this? Why would God do make this weird thing? Why would it why why a picture of his dead body? Why not a picture of his living body? Like there's so many questions like why would God do this? Well, first of all, we can never say why God does something exactly, you know, in his infinite wisdom. But also, I think the reason, I think the main reason that God did this is I think this is his love letter to the age of science people living in the age of science who demand empirical proof, who demand that there has to be something tangible that you can test to prove that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And the shroud is it. The shroud is it. We don't need it, but it's there. And it is weird. It is strange. But the more you look at it and the more you dwell on it, it will haunt you. <laughs> when you begin to realize how much Jesus suffered for our sins, every single one of those scourges inflicted pain on him that we can barely imagine, and to be covered in those scourge marks from head to toe, and then to be crucified and inflicted with a crown of thorns and to die by asphyxiation on the cross. Oh, furthermore, the image on the shroud reveals some x-ray details. So the light that came from the body ended up revealing some, some x-rays of the man's bones. Like you can see, you can actually see the bones in his hands. And best we can tell from all of that information on the shroud, there are no broken bones on the man on the shroud, which correlates with scripture, which says none of his bones were broken. So it's just absolutely remarkable. There's, there are so many questions still yet to be answered, and yet so many of the answers seem to be satisfactory. So um, can you believe that this is only half of the information that I have to share? Uh, in part two, <laughs> in part two, in two weeks, I'm going to go over the historical evidence, which is, okay, we, ha we seem to have a miracle on our hands here, but how do we connect it to the first century? How do we get it from... France in 1355 to Jerusalem in 30 AD. But that's a question for next time. So that's all for tonight. I guess I'll say a quick prayer and get us out of here. Lord Jesus, we believe in your love for us. We believe in the death that you died for us, Lord. We believe in your resurrection from the dead. We believe in your redemption for us. We believe that you have promised us eternal life with you. And Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that you would bless us all with wisdom and discernment and increasing knowledge, Lord, that we would always be able to learn and decipher the truth of this world that we live in, Lord, your truth, the truth of your work. And Lord, that whether or not the shroud ends up being authentic or not, Lord, that we will recognize and pursue your face, Lord, all the way to the day where you say, well done, good and faithful servant.
Lord, I thank you for the blood that you shed. Whether we've looked at pictures of that blood tonight or not, Lord, you shed your blood for us, and Lord, we thank you for that, for that tremendous sacrifice so that we can be with you forever. And Lord, I pray that you would draw us all closer to you. Lord, I pray that you would unite your church, draw us all closer to each other in love and in faith. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Well, this has been fascinating. Told you so.